the longest serving Hollywood correspondent in the annals of American journalism, Bob Thomas, began his AP career reporting grape and cattle prices in Fresno. The heat in the Central Valley was so oppressive, he had to take salt tablets to combat dehydration. After complaining to L.A. bureau chief Hubbard Keevey in 1944, Thomas learned that a spot had opened up in Hollywood. Robin Coons, who handled that beat, had been drafted. Well, I certainly was glad to get out of Fresno. It was a great chance for somebody who was kind of Hollywood crazy because the studios were wide open then. You could go to MGM with a publicist and uh, he would take you from stage to stage and you'd see Gene Kelly doing a dance routine. Uh, Fred Astaire would be in the re rehearsal hall. Lucille Ball would be doing a big dance number. Or Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy would be doing a, a light comedy, and they all were available. In 1925, the AP Board of Directors had reversed course and granted feature status to a range of subjects, including motion pictures, which it had previously considered not newsworthy. When the president of the Motion Picture Producers Association assured General Manager Kent Cooper that there would be no faking of news stories by press agents. Cooper agreed that AP should cover the movie industry. When Thomas took over the Hollywood column in 1944, he was just 23, but he looked much younger. Claudette Colbert once refused him an interview because she thought he was writing for a high school paper. In addition to boyish looks, Thomas had the energy for the long hours and the savvy for the sometimes delicate social maneuvering that the job demanded. Although assignments such as tea with Joan Crawford or an evening with Humphrey Bogart could be difficult to see as work, they were just part of the job. Thomas could never be sure that his story would be well received by his subjects, who generally demanded to be seen in the best possible light. They were often highly competitive with one another and had their own relationships with the studio to protect. I know you have a good story, Bob, but please be kind, was the closer to many an interview. Thomas covered his first Oscar ceremony on March 2, 1944 the year Casablanca won for Best Picture. He never missed another Academy Awards show in the course of his 66-year career. The happiest winner he ever saw was Humphrey Bogart in 1952, when the actor took back all the nasty things he had ever said about the Academy Awards. In 1954, photographers backstage suggested that Grace Kelly kissed her fellow winner, Marlon Brando. I think he should kiss me, she said primly. And then there was Jimmy Stewart's unforgettable tribute to the dying Gary Cooper, who was watching from his hospital bed. There was the return of Charlie Chaplin and John Wayne's last stand before he died. Thomas would say, each year brings the makings of nostalgia. Thomas's career began in the golden age of Hollywood, when stars were under contract to the studios, movies were regularly shot on Hollywood lots, and television did not compete for dominance of the entertainment industry. So there were hundreds of actors around, and the studios instructed them to give interviews. Anything that helped promote their recent movie was to the studio's advantage. In this reporter's paradise, Thomas contrived ingenious ways of spending time with the stars. Uh, at any rate, I figured you got to have a gimmick. I thought, well, why not enter the story? Not that I'm hammy or anything, but why not uh, participate in something? And so I started doing stories. Uh, I had a dancing lesson from Vera Ellen, 
I had a swimming lesson with Esther Williams. Uh, well, I could swim, but she wasn't very good except on the backstroke. And then the director threw me out of the tank. Who is that in there? <laughs> Other interviews were less arduous. Thomas recalled his first with Marilyn Monroe. I had a very warm and pleasant interview with her and thought she was delightful and, and funny. And she had a great sense of humor. Some of it was fed to her by the publicists. Like uh, later on, what did you have on when you were posed for that shot? And, uh, she said, uh, Chanel number no. five. So she would use these things, and uh, publicists said that uh, she would look good in a potato sack. Of all the celebrities Thomas interviewed over his career, the most remarkable and the only one he characterized as a visionary was Walt Disney. While Disneyland was under construction, Disney invited Thomas to the site in the Anaheim Orange and Walnut Groves. Driving around in a Jeep, Disney talked nonstop, bringing to life the beguiling sanctuary he envisioned, where children and adults could mingle with the Disney characters they already knew. When the park opened on July 17, 1955, Thomas brought along his two young daughters to be able to write from their perspective. Close your eyes until you round the corner, instructed the operator of the Peter Pan fly-through, and the girls settled into the tiny galleon. They clamped their hands over their eyes. When they looked again, they were sailing out over London, narrowly missing Big Ben. Soon they were over Neverland, peering down on Skull Rock and almost being snared by Captain Hook. The girls were tireless. Not so their parents. Tomorrowland would have to wait until tomorrow. <laughs>